In Session With is a new vodcast series with world-class music creators discussing how to thrive in the music industry today. This vodcast is hosted by Session, the collaboration app for creators. Welcome uh, back to the In Session With podcast. Yes, no, you're not, you're not back. You're, no. you're, you're brand new. Yeah. Um, welcome. <laughs> I'm sat here today. My first podcast. <laughs> My virgin po- podcast. I'm sat here today and I hope you don't mind me calling you this. Um, as long a, as you don't say veteran. A real music industry. No, I won't say it. <laughs> okay. um, somewhat, you, you, you've, 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 you've been around a while. Yeah. This is the brilliant, you are the brilliant Jonathan Quornby, oh. writer, producer. Extraordinaire. I've had moments of being quite good and a lot of moments of being very <laughs> mediocre. So, <laughs> You played a very small role in the beginning of my career. I did. Actually, I was talking to uh, a friend of mine last <laughs> night before last about that and saying how you'd... Um, you know, because obviously Gomez was a sort of a Sheffield. You came, you you emerged from Sheffield, didn't you? I know yeah. you weren't actually from Sheffield originally, but That's it sort right. of that was your that was your original kind of ground, stomping ground. It was, yeah, yeah. With yeah, because I was uh, I was sort of peripherally on that thing because we'd um, taken over a studio called Axis. That's from, right, with uh, Kevin, a band called Concert Angels, who were legendary in their own time. Um, yeah, no. So we're just saying how how well he'd done, and you know, what a it just it all flowered from there, didn't it? Yeah, we had a good run, you just did. like yourself you well, in places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, at that point, you were one half of the formidable uh, I was. duo uh, Bacon and Quarmby, uh, yeah. producing and writing for an extensive list of artists. Well, actually, oddly, mainly producing, and and you know, I don't, you know, the um, I I was a you know, a youngish man with a young family and the writing thing was actually quite problematic because I did start off writing and then it getting paid as a writer even then was quite hard. Whereas getting paid as a producer is really easy. You say, somebody says, do you want to make a record? And you go, yeah, it'll be 50 grand. And they go, okay, that's 50 grand. You, you do it and you get paid 50 grand. Whereas you write, you know, you write and um, you get paid... Somewhere down the line, I mean, you do get paid. It's yeah. not, I'm not. I'm not suggesting there's any sort of criminality, but it, <laughs> it's a long process. So when you've got a mortgage to pay and hungry babies to feed, but you very much come from that programmer arranger Absolutely. brain, don't yeah. you? Because I, yeah. I always remember you sat at the keyboard in the studio. Sadly, yes. No, but that, that's kind of. I mean, yes. if I think of you, that's how I yes. see you. Probably on Cubase or something, <laughs> or Atari even. Um, but yeah, <laughs> you definitely, were to... <laughs> definitely a, a range. I mean, I suppose the thing is. You know, everybody talks about production, but actually production, I don't, I'm not preempting anything here, but I'm just jumping in, but it's an interesting to use the word arranger because a lot of people talk about production, they, they're they not really talking about production, they talk about arrangement. And so you talk, you know, you, get, you have, you have, shall we say, young artists in, and of course everybody wants to be a producer, and everybody to an extent is a producer, just in the same way that everybody's a photographer because they've got an iPhone, everybody's a producer because they've got a laptop. But actually when they say producer, what they mean is arranger, and, and I think that it's quite... It's quite dis- distinct because the producer is simply the person who is responsible for delivering the record to the label. And some people do a lot in that process and some people don't do very much. But it doesn't actually matter so long as your name is on the credits at the end. If it says produced by whoever, you could have called into the studio a couple of times, gone, hi, everybody, you know, here I am, way great, and then disappeared. But that's still your record because if it had not worked out, You'd have got not you, the person who's got the producer hat on would have got blamed. So as long as as when you got the producer hat on, you carry on having hit records, you carry on being a record producer. But as everybody says, everybody goes, oh yeah, but I thought of that guitar part, or I thought of putting strings on it, or I thought of this, and you go, yeah, but that's not production, that's arrangement. It's a completely separate thing. And actually, you know, I think it's a bit of a shame for people to talk about to everybody what to want to be a producer because not everybody wants to be responsible for delivering the record. But I think it's great when people want to be arrangers because it's exciting to be part of the creative process. God, that was a long sentence. That was an it? excellent answer, though. Stop now. Um, you did, well, with, with Kevin, you did all kinds of actually did Muse. I promise not to go quite so diverse. No, no, time. like it's good to keep it diverse. Uh, Muse, Sugar Babes, The Long Pigs, Finley Quay, Plan B. Yep. Won Brits and Grammys along yep. the way. Yeah. Um, no one was more surprised than my Grammy. I actually got the Grammy through the post. I have no idea. So best reggae album, nineteen somewhere. And, was that Spearhead? Uh, no, it was Ziggy Marley. Oh, Ziggy Marley. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, it was. Uh, of course. I, I didn't even. I didn't even know. 
and actually didn't really think very much about it. And I put it on the wall, and then um, some Americans came to stay, and they were like, "Oh wow, you got a Grammy." I was like, <laughs> "Oh, yeah, I don't know." And it, yeah, but so. Didn't well, to, didn't go to party but like that. We're still bitter. I'm still sitting here with a Grammy winner, <laughs> you know. A, bit, a bitter Grammy winner. A bitter Grammy winner. <laughs> Missed the party. <laughs> um, but then, you know, fascinatingly, you founded an online music distribution company. Yeah. <laughs> uh, AWOL, um, yeah. which I'm sure a lot of people who are listening to this will be familiar with. Um, yeah. Which is, we'll get on to, but like, you know, but following selling that off, you then returned to yeah. focus back on fully yeah. on songwriting really. Yeah. Um and you based at Rack Studios and I mean it was a bit of a I think it was a bit of a, a needs must kind of scenario because because actually I I as an example of this, so I I, I quite early on I, I coming back into doing music again from running the A Wall thing, I uh, was asked to do Benjamin Clementine's record. And I was involved in it quite early and actually there's a guy in France called Sylvain Tire who has recently left Universal, and he's a very good friend of mine. And his English isn't great, so he was unwise enough to literally read an email that had been sent to him by the independent label that Benjamin signed to, which read, why are you letting that sad old 80s producer get involved with this, with this record? <laughs> and so I suppose my mental process was, if you write a song, the great thing about writing is if you write a song and it gets used, you benefit. Often you write a song, and if you do a good job of tarting it up to make it sound quite good, sometimes they come back and go, oh, we really like the song, and oh, we really like the way it sounds, so why don't you get involved? You know, and that can work in multifarious ways. I've had things where I've written a song, and they actually haven't liked the song, but they've liked the way it sounded, so they've gone, you know, do you want to get involved in the production side of things? Sorry, arrangement, production, whatever. Um, so... I kind of figured out in 2012, well, 2014, we sold AWOL in 2012 and 2014, I'd actually come out of my uh, client retention period, um, that by writing it meant that I could get involved with artists, but without actually having to get, you don't have to go, oh, I need, I need three grand or I need a budget or whatever. You, you get involved, you form a relationship and see where it goes. Which is, you know, we'd hope that's what any good creative relationship would look yeah. like, right? That that is the reality of, mm -hmm. you know, people work together because it works. Um, taking you right back to the beginning. Oh, ouch. Ouch, sorry. I still, what a cruel thing for that man to say. Sorry, but taking you right back, that, what's, what's, I know. Anyway, well, I, know. That's I, was, outrageous. I was devastated. Of course you were, <laughs> no, but it's really. wrong it as well. I actually kind of sympathised with him. I was like, yeah, that's probably what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> um... I'm going to take you back to the beginning. Um, you were studying architecture, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. Uh, but then one day you went. Um, what, you know, when and how did the muse uh, sort of strike and, and, and take you down this road? Well, I'd been moonlighting in bands all the way through the architectural... I, I, mean, I, I did three years. It's a seven-year course, so I can't claim to be a fully qual qualified architect. But actually, there's quite a lot of correlation with music and architecture anyway, and I, you often find that people in music have flirted with architecture. I mean, actually, the, 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 guy, in the, year, the guy the year above me was um, Mark Bryden, oh. who m was Maloko, half of Maloko. Yeah, and so, I. and I think quite a lot of, you know, I think it's quite a lot of cross-pollinization. I think the way your brain works as an architect is not dissimilar to the way your brain works as a musician. I mean, that's a bit of a grandiose statement, but I think they are together. And, and I, I'm, I mean, to, to put it, succinctly i went into a building with this a guy who was an architect and we walked around the building and i could almost see him crying because he loved architecture and this building got such a massive effect on him that it was a like a visceral emotional impact for him and i was like yeah it's all right it's building isn't it whereas with music i would have been in you know i'd have been the person crying um well whatever you know having the big emotional thing and he might have been work so and i think at that point i thought well maybe he obviously is somebody who loves architecture so much he sh they should be doing it, and maybe I'm not. Yeah. So I went off and did music instead. You prefer your cathedrals made of sound. Cath <laughs> yeah. It, it is really fascinating to me that you and Kevin, um, your old production partner, got ahead of the curve and set up AWOL. Um, you know, one of the first direct digital distribution companies, 
um, and and a huge concern now, recently purchased by Sony. That's right. Um, what for a little bit more than let, we yeah. sold it for? I'd just like to add as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what led you there? What what? How did that happen? Well, it was a bit of a it was a bit of a sort of weird concoction of circumstances because Kevin and I've been we've been pretty successful through through the nineties, um, and then uh, but sort of turn of the century. Um, there was a lot of uh, that's when the whole sort of X Factor thing started. Um, it sort of felt. I think. I think we were just at the end of a cycle. We'd been like the cool guys, and then we'd been like the guys who used to be cool. And by the time we got to sort of two thousand two, two thousand three, we were like the guys who definitely used to be cool. And you know, work had got a bit thin on the ground, and we were sort of scratching around, wondering what to do. And uh, actually, a, a yoga, f- <laughs> a friend of mine, via so it's sort of quite a bizarre story, but I was quite friendly with Carly Simon and Ben Taylor. And Ben Taylor's ex-manager, Kip Stroden, who did yoga, knew a guy called... I know it's a bit of a shaggy dog story, but it's, he knew a guy called Dendal Fiegelson. And he said, oh, this guy, Dendal Fiegelson, is coming over because he's going to run iTunes UK. And iTunes... I was like, yeah, I know about iTunes, but vaguely. Um, and he said, he's, you know, he's not going to know anybody. Can you, like, take him out for dinner or just be nice to him? Uh, so we met up with Denzel and it was, it was like a bizarre experience. We went into, I think he was living in Victoria at the time. We went into his bedroom and he got his computer set up there and he was programming the front page of iTunes UK. And we, he was like, do you want to put anything on there? We're like, yeah. And we went through our catalog next week. I, you know, the page rolled. This is when iTunes was like so much the sort of, you know, it, it wasn't really well... And I look back and sort of laugh and think, you know, we actually populated the front page of iTunes UK with our own sh- shit because <laughs> the guy who was doing it was just sat there in his bedroom doing it. Because what had happened with Denzel had actually been Steve Jobs' music guy. So when Steve Jobs did his keynote speeches in the days when Mac was deeply unsexy, he'd be like, who can put some music on in my keynote speech? And the girl called call, call that guy Denzel because Denzel knows about music. So Denzel like, put the CD in and before Steve came on, ha, ah, Steve, stop. You know, so when they had to do iTunes, when they started iTunes, like, who do we know knows about music? Denzel. So Denzel was brought in to do the US. And then when they broadened it out, he was brought in to do the UK. So we met Denzel, who happened to have this CD picking and packing business, which was pretty much dormant, called AWOL. And we said, well, why don't we, um, why don't we sign up to, you know, obviously you can, get us, you can get us in there. Why don't we sign up and... Uh, in all, I mean, it sounds crazy now, but our honest ambition was that Kevin and I had done about eight albums that had never come out. And we thought, well, you know what? If we can get those albums out into the world, we'll be totally happy. And that was literally what we thought was going to happen. And then um, we got it going. And because because we got the deal quite early, we were like a, a very early conduit onto iTunes. So we got a call from, you know, and I remember the, you know, the big thing to shout about, we got a call from the Arctic Monkeys. And uh, they were like, oh, Jeff Baradell was like, oh, can you get, can you get lads music on, out on iTunes? We're like, yeah, you know, I mean that was one of many, but yeah. and it and it accelerated, and I think it, I think it's a good example of some people become successful just by being in the right place at the right time. We weren't very good at it, we hadn't got a plan, we didn't know about all the stuff we knew about in the end, which was you know exit and scaling and like we hadn't got any clue. We were just like, if we can get these eight albums up, and just by being early, we did quite well. I suppose, you know, maybe it's a funny question. Um, uh, actually, that's not a funny question at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at this going, that isn't a funny question. I mean, what are they asking here? <laughs> um, it's so, it you know... It's been an extraordinary. It sounds like you're trying to find a way of phrasing something. Yeah, it's no, no, quite no, rude. no. Look, it's, it's sort of. <laughs> it, it's been an. You've had a, a, an extraordinary sort of impossible kind of a career. Actually, it's it's really amazing. Uh, sort of looking, going through it, looking at all things you've worked on. Obviously, a well, the songs you've written. Um, do you have a sort of way of you know? What what do you feel like the highlights of your career have been, or or like you know, 
what made you feel more creatively fulfilled or or or, or do, are there things that like there's the things that made you feel creatively fulfilled and the things that filled your bank account yes and 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 like how do you think about all of yeah. that stuff i like, think that's i think that's a really good question because i think there is i think inevitably in life there there's an there's a dichotomy between what is genuinely brilliant and what is genuinely good and stuff that is lauded so what you so there's a there's a inevitably a tendency for you to for one to go, well, it's the record that was a big hit, or it's the thing that won an award, or it's the it's the whatever, whatever, and you you you're inexorably drawn towards these places which have got more applause around them. Um, whereas I don't know if I would necessarily say that the things I've done, which have done the most well, I've been the most proud of. I suppose what I, what I suppose, I suppose an interesting observation that. I'd say often the things that have been the hardest have been probably the most brilliant, which is actually something I don't really want to have to face. But the, you know, and I, you know, two artists I work with, Benjamin Clementine and Finley Quay. I mean, Finley Quay is a long time ago. I suppose people now will remember Benjamin because I think he's in the new June film, and I think that his the track we did together is the theme for the morning show uh, on Apple TV. So. You know, he's becoming, he's, he's you know, he's, he's... And with both those artists, the making the record with them was challenging. And there were moments when probably they felt the same, that, you know, it was going to be touch and go, whether it was going to work out or not. Um, and I don't know if there is necessarily the correlation between pain and greatness. But I think at some point in the process, there has to be pain. And I think sometimes... You know, I. This sounds like a really horrible thing to say, but you know, I get the opportunity. The, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to work with a lot of young creative people, and when somebody, when somebody, when I meet somebody and and they're really good, you know, and there's so many of them because because the the bar is so high now for everybody. It's like if you're not amazing, you might as well just not even bother. So obviously they're going to be amazing singers. Obviously they probably play an instrument really well. They're probably really good looking or distinctive looking in some way. They've probably always felt like they were in some way a little bit special. That's why they're there. Um, but then you're going, okay, well, what are you, what do you want to say? And that's where it starts to become complicated because actually that's the only thing that's actually important. That, actually twice. That's the only thing that's really important. It's like, what are you saying? What is, what is your message? What is your... And a lot of the time, that message comes from a place of pain. It has to. It, it comes from heartbreak, or it comes from parental problems, it comes from being bullied, it comes from just a, psych, a psychology where you don't feel to fit in with the world. Because I think that the, the, the act of creation is people trying to rebalance themselves with the world. So people who are out of balance with the world, are, they create, they create, create to try and put themselves back in balance. And hopefully they never succeed because the point where they put themselves back in balance is generally when they start being not very good. But people who are already in balance, if you talk to people and you go, oh, you know, have you got a boyfriend, girlfriend? Like, oh, yeah, we're really happy. Oh, what about your parents? Did you, you know, did they anything, you know, did, you know, oh, no, we, I love my mum and dad. They're so great. And like, did you get bullied at school? No, no, I had a great time at school. It was like best years. You know, you'd be like, okay, so, so why are you here? Oh, well, I'm a really good singer. It's like, yeah, but who fucking cares? It's like everybody's a good singer. Like that's that's ground zero is you're a really good singer. It's like the great artists are the people who have something important to talk about. It's not about being good singers or good. God knows it's not about being good musicians. I mean that's the most boring thing in the world. I just listened to that. Um, I don't know if you've listened to it yet. The Miracle and Wonder Paul Simon audio book. Have I you listened to that I yet? To it. It's really really worth listening to because he's. An incredible. He's a highly iterative writer. He keeps rewriting over and over again. Yeah. In a in a highly crafted way, and clearly it takes him many years sometimes to write songs. Mm. Um, and I've always thought that I I I find it quite strange now that the the the, the sort of the world of songwriting is songs get written in forty eight hours and 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 listening to him talk. You realise that some of these songs that we all recognise as mm. as sort of great American songs mm. of the past hundred years mm. were hewn from 
from rock over blood, a, sweat, and tears. Blood, literally. sweat, and, yeah, yeah. In order to, I mean, it, I, I feel slightly differently about music. So I feel, I think, I understand the the balancing. That I, that's really interesting. Sometimes I think, I I think about songs more like as narrative objects, and that there's no point in telling any story unless it's a good story. There's no point in making any film unless it's got a good story. There's no mm. t- there's no point in. It's like what's the where's the where's the story where's the substance that would make me care about the exactly. person in the song the protagonist of the song so that I'm still there at the end exactly it's, and 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 I don't think we talk enough about that to to young creators because no, I agree. because songs are treated like this other thing like it's just building blocks of sound or something um, when in fact you look at most of the great songs that people love there's something there's something at work there in terms of how we react to narrative structure just as human beings. I mean, it's like you, just, you said, like, it's no, no point in saying something if you don't, haven't got anything to say. I think the best piece of writing advice that was, has ever been uttered was Philip Roth, who said that write like your parents are dead. The world doesn't want to hear a nice middle-class kid right. um, say how nice and middle-class their life is. That's right. Um, <laughs> 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 um, sorry, we're terrible. No, no, it's like no, two, I, two more, no, no, I, 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 I totally agree with you about the. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've kind of lost my thread on the, on the song thing. No, but yes, you're, you're totally right. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, I suppose the thing is that that to me the sort of the you know the the, the songwriting process, and that's, it's interesting you talk about the about going back on things because. I do think there has to be like a spark of something. I think that, you know, because most of my song sessions are one-day sessions. And I think you have to, there has to be like a magical moment where you go, ooh, well, hopefully, um, where something special, where something magical happens or something which gives that, well, you know what it's like. You, you go, oh, okay, we've got something here that's amazing. But then what you don't have... For the most part these days, because most writing sessions are one-day sessions and, and people that tend not collab- to collaborate sporadically over one-day periods rather than for weeks at a time, is you don't have that, you don't have that ability to, to thoroughly dig down into it. And, you know, you talk the story about Paul McCartney that yesterday was scrambled eggs for, you know, months, scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs, whatever, and then eventually became yesterday. In the modern parlance, he, that would have been scrambled eggs or it probably would have been some dreadful word that... that <laughs> Is you know, but he was in he was in a, a he was in a, a a creative structure which allowed him the bandwidth to have to percolate that idea for a long time and then come up with something that was a bit better. You know, a lot of the way that this works and has always worked though is that you know we get you get recognised for your work. I suppose the pro- the problem is is if there isn't a way to sort of recognise the good work anymore. Um. Then, then we're in trouble, because you know where does it get found? And I suppose that that probably brings us back to the idea of of, of of credits and and recognition. Because I feel like if somebody is coming into the industry and they're young and they they're hearing what we're saying now and they think, well, I am somebody who 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 is approaching this with integrity mm. of decision making and. I know what I want and I believe in creating great songs and I, I think I know how to do that. Um, we've got to be able to, you know, there's got to be some hope in this conversation, hasn't there? there, there, there I yeah. think there is, there, is a, there is a way forward for them um, and, it's, and it's through finding recognition in different ways in the industry now, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably true. I, and also I think that there's... I think there's, that humans are very ingenious creatures, and, and what's happening at the moment is, uh, is that through, probably not for very good moral reasons, but the the ability of the ability of shall we say middle class artists or yeah I'll use middle class artists to to eke a living out on Spotify and Apple Music, but obviously everybody talks about Spotify because they actually publish the numbers is becoming increasingly difficult because you know five or so years ago, there were a lot of people doing quite good numbers on on playlists, whereas that, that tends not to be so much the case now. So, so what what's going to happen is that is that people who are genuinely creative are going to end up getting increasingly frozen out of the marketplace, and when that reaches a tipping point, they'll find another way of doing it. 
and that I think is the reality of the situation. Just you know, if if in the end you, as uh, somebody who's not signed to a big label, doesn't have a big promotional budget, who doesn't come off a big TikTok platform or whatever, can't find a way through, they'll still be making music which is undeniably brilliant, which people feel passionate about, and it'll seep out the, another way. And I think that's actually the reality of what will happen. Yeah. And and talent is like a is like water, isn't it? It'll always find That's a right. way out. It'll find, a, find way a way out. out yeah. That's right. And I think you know, I, I talk to a lot of people in the, in the NFT community. I think that might be a way of doing it. I actually think blockchain is a really positive thing because I think that being able to have that undeniable uh, prov- provenance of uh, creativity is great. You know, I think all those things are really really good. I think the sad thing at the moment is, you know, I'll I, and and I think it's another thing. Well, I'm just. You know, I'm just like not in touch with, but I, you know, I'll often come into my artist of the day who will be a, somebody in the, a teenager or in their early 20s. And I'll go, I'll just listen to New Music Friday and they'll go, God, it's so fucking shit. And I'm going, that's quite weird because I feel like that. But that's funny because you as a 20 year old, you feel like that. So where is all the good music? Because it's not there. Well, if we took all of the artists, good and bad, who 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 would you say... You know, not that you'd regret, but like, who would you have loved to have worked with that you've never worked with? Who would you think, oh God, I would love oh, to get my hands on that? Is there anyone? Uh, do you know that's a right, that's a, that's actually a really good question. I'm trying to think of anybody. I'm trying to think of somebody contemporary. I suppose that's the that's the that's the challenge. Uh, do you know? I'd actually love to work with Kendrick Lamar. Yeah. I'd love to work with Kendrick Lamar. I think he'd be definitely yeah. up there on my on my list. He's uh, amazing, isn't he? And he, he I, I love the way that his albums come out slowly as well. Yeah, I think he's just great. I think he's amazing. It's like yeah. he's clearly like really doing the work, and you can hear it. Yeah, yeah. I'm also kind of closet fan of J Cole, but oh yeah, uh, my son's but, a massive J Cole yeah, fan. That's that same thing. Yeah. That's right. So I actually taught my son to drive. Um, well, I didn't. The driving instructor did, but I, I, was, I suffered uh, the uh, the pleasure of taking him around in the passenger seat a lot. And actually, it was it was really great because he would play his playlists, you know. And he he's, he's a big kind of hip hop grime, you know, aficionado, and listen to music constantly. And so the, our whole journeys would be have this play his playlist on, and it was great for me, you know, because. So I thought some of it was that's where I found that I actually really like J. Cole. I was like, oh, put some more J. Yeah, Cole. Yeah, no, I'm all right with J. Great Cole. Great production values, amazing detail in the records, a lot of work in it. You know, it's really, yeah. Beautiful. Well, and I... then obviously, Bob Marley. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get onto the living or dead. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Of course. So my, yeah, my secret reggae roots. <laughs> well, not so secret. You've got a Grammy hanging on the yeah, wall. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah. It's been an enormous pleasure to talk to you today. No, mate. you too. It's, I'm, I'm glad we've met again, actually. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, um, I just like you, you haven't, you've, you've barely changed <laughs> over all the years. <laughs> Nor have you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just say thank you and uh, cheers. No, thank you for being so sorry. Cheers, man. Take care. For more episodes of In Session With, subscribe to our YouTube channel or find us on your preferred podcast provider. To get Session's free music collaboration tools, go to session.id.